Welcome to the 13th chapter on differential invariance and proof theory in the logical foundations of cyber-physical systems textbook. This advanced chapter studies some meta properties of differential equations proving by investigating aspects of the proof theory of differential equations. So the theory of doing proofs about differential equations, which is on the one hand of significant theoretical interest, but it also has some practical insights in store for us for the answer to the question, what types of differential invariants to search for under what circumstances. Our primary tool for this will be relative deductive power. So the question whether all properties provable with one technique are also provable with another technique. Because if they are, you know, and we fail to prove it with the first technique, there's no point in trying to prove it with a second technique because they would have all been possible already. It only makes sense to move on to a technique that can prove strictly more. Speaking of proving techniques, what we have seen to prove properties of differential equations are the techniques of differential invariance where we prove properties of differential equations by induction based on the right hand side. Differential cuts, where we prove first another property about the differential equation and change its evolution domain constraint to make sure that we assume from now on that we can't leave the region we just proved a moment ago we can't leave. That enables us to stack inductive proofs of differential equations on top of each other so that we first worry about easier properties and then subsequently worry about more and more complicated properties until we find the one proof that we would like Differential weakening is kind of the opposite. It proves simple properties of differential equations that are entailed directly from the evolution domain constraint. Just by assumption, essentially, we can't leave the domain we promised not to leave. Differential ghosts are an advanced proof technique for proving properties of ODEs by changing the dynamics of the system. So unlike differential cuts, which change the domain constraint, Differential ghosts change the differential equation itself. All of this was meta in the sense that we didn't worry about one particular differential equation and one particular property. What we understood were recipes for proving properties about differential equations by and large. Now in this chapter, we're looking at one more meta level up, the proof theory. So the questions with the techniques we've identified for proving properties of differential equations, how much can we prove? Which will lead us down to a study of proof theory. So we will be doing proofs about proofs. When you think about how useful that is, you're doing a meta-meta-meta analysis. Speaking of useful, so loops, of course, have the search for invariance as the most exciting, but definitely also the most non-trivial question. Likewise, for different equations, the most fundamental question is its search for invariance. And for example, these differential invariants actually have a very useful property. Once we've got them, the proof is really very easy, and that's a computationally quite attractive property. The flip side is, of course, that just like finding invariance of loops can be quite challenging, finding invariance for different equations is the only fundamental challenge in town, but it is also quite comp complicated. On the one hand, that's reassuring, because at least we will know that the proofs work as soon as we find the right invariance for the job. But it also tells us that it can be quite challenging. You shouldn't be intimidated by this thought, because it's still worth the trouble, because, well, CPS is so darn important. Fortunately, differential equations also enjoy many pleasant properties that we can exploit in order to help us find differential invariance in the first place. At the latest at this point, you should realize how important it is to study and understand differential equations. And the way we will do that is consider various classes of differential invariants and investigate how they relate to one another in terms of what they can prove, which in fact turns out to be one of the most beautiful uses of proof theory 
of direct use for us as well. For example, that will tell us if all properties that are provable from differential invariance of shape A are also provable with differential invariance of shape B, then if we haven't found the proof of shape A, then there's no point in moving on to try and find something of shape B. We need to consider something else instead. Admittedly, in this chapter, I will have to balance between a comprehensive handling of the undoubtedly important subject matter and the core intuition for it. Many of the proofs in this chapter are simplified compared to the full argument by focusing only on the core argument, but you can read up the more complex indirect proofs that are in, written up in full in, for example, the Logical Methods in Computer Science 2012 journal. But without further ado, let's understand the proof theory of differential equations, the theory of what can be proved about differential equations by doing proofs about proofs and by doing proofs about relations between how the provability of one logical formula relates to the probability of the same logical formula with different proof calculi. So we will be relating the question whether a formula P can be proved using technique A, to the question whether the same formula P can be proved using techniques B for all formulas P that we could think of. On the modeling and control side, this chapter mostly helps with understanding core argumentative principles behind CPS is more and thereby sheds light on the pragmatic question how to tame their analytic complexity. The chapter is big on computational thinking though. One very important fundamental aspect, arguably even the most important one of computer science, studies questions about the limits of computation, which helps us understand what can be done and what cannot be done either in absolute terms, computability theory, which studies what is computable with a computer program and what is not, or in relative terms, complexity theory, where you study what is computable in a characteristically quicker way in one class of resource bounds on time and space compared to another. The answer to these questions are very fundamental not only because they're independent of the machine model that's used for computation by the church doing thesis, but often also because a most important understanding in the problem space starts with an understanding for what can and what cannot be done. For example, what cannot be done is beautifully packaged up in the theorem of Rice, which says that all non-trivial properties of programs aren't computable. Or what can be done. For example, every problem that can be solved with a deterministic algorithm in polynomial time can also be solved with a non-deterministic algorithm in polynomial time. And the converse question, whether also every problem that can be solved by a non-deterministic algorithm in polynomial time can also be solved by a deterministic algorithm in polynomial time, that's the famous P versus NP question. In this chapter, we're developing such an understanding of the limits of what can and what cannot be done in the land of proofs about differential equations, by studying the proof theory of differential equations, so the theory of probability and of proofs about differential equations. Proof theory is, of course, very interesting in many other cases as well, but this direct study will enable us to, you know, in a very pragmatic way, understand how we need to go about conducting proofs in CPSs directly. That basically leads us to a relativity theory for proofs, where we say, does this one way of proving it give us more than another way of proving it? It does inform us during differential invariant search, and does give us an intuition for differential equations proof, which is sort of the pragmatic learning goal of today's chapter, where we're practicing the art of doing inductive proofs about differential equations, which is very helpful for us to scale up reasoning to complicated CPS challenges. Let's briefly recap what techniques we saw for differential equations proving 
There's on the one hand differential weakening, where we prove a safety condition, a post condition for a differential equation, just by directly proving that it follows from the evolution domain constraint. That's sufficient. That's a very simple proof technique. Of course, it doesn't even consider the differential equation itself. So it isn't alone fully general, but can be combined with other techniques in general ways. Of course, if things already follow from the evolution domain constraint, we shouldn't be doing more complicated proofs for it. Differential invariance, and that's what we will be focusing on today, is the question whether proving an invariant of a differential equation reduces to proving, well, its inductive structure by proving its differential is true after assigning the right-hand side of a differential equation to the left-hand side of a differential equation by discrete assignment, and then prove that the differential f, so the property that is determining in which direction f changes its potential truth value, if that always stays true, so the formula stays true along the dynamics, at least within the evolution domain constraint. And the differential cuts, where we first prove something else about a differential equation. So we first prove that we can't leave the region C, and then we assume the system to remain within the region C, which uh, sounds like a change in the dynamics of the system, but it really is only a pseudo change, because even if the textual description changed, and we assume more here, we first prove that we can assume it. It's like a lemma for a differential equation to first prove something, and then assume it at every moment in time along the evolution of the ODE. Remember, these really came from axioms, the differential weakening axiom, differential invariant axiom, and differential cut axiom, but today we'll work primarily with proof rules. We also saw differential ghosts, but won't actually make use of them, no matter how powerful they are for today's chapter. And also remember there was the differential effect axiom that enabled us to copy out the effect that a differential equation has on the prime variables directly as we're already bundling up in the differential invariant proof rule. Well, what then about differential equation proof theory? Let's first get started. We have the differential invariant proof rule, um, but it can be very helpful to prove properties not quite so directly, but slightly more indirectly by settling on a question where if we start in an initial region where A is true, do we always stay in the region where B is true as we're following a differential equation within the evolution domain constraint and reduce this with a cut in the monotonicity principle to proving an actual invariant F is true in the beginning, that F itself is inductive by the differential invariant principle, for example, and that this invariant that we've identified is strong enough to imply the post condition that we were interested in. Just like for loops, where we also identified a core induction principle and then used it in order to generalize the loop invariant as we needed it. What we will be looking at now is the question, what can be proved with differential invariants, these formulas F, that are limited to formulas of specific shapes, whereby di omega, I mean the class of all properties that are provable, where the differential invariants are restricted to just mention the operators omega. So for example, greater or equal will be all those formulas provable by using only differential invariants of the shape greater or equal something, and no logical connectives, for example, but we could be using bigger sets, for example, equations um, or conjunctions and disjunctions of these inequalities and things like that that enables us to then compare. Can we prove more if we admit differential invariance of a larger syntactic fragment or can we prove less? And we will write A less or equal B for two of those classes of differential invariance if indeed all formulas that are provable with differential invariance proofs in A are also provable somehow, possibly in a different way, with proofs using differential invariance only from class B. And we write the opposite. A is not less or equal B whenever that's not the case. So some property can only be proved using techniques in A and cannot be proved in any way using techniques in B. 
and we'll be writing a is equivalent to b if you know both inclusions hold. So everything that's provable with a is also provable with b, but also vice versa. Everything that's provable with b is also provable with a. In other words, both a and b have the exact same deductive power. One of them can prove a property, the other one can prove the exact same property as well. And we write a is strictly less than b if, well, everything that a can prove, b can prove true, but not vice versa. In other words, a has strictly less deductive power, even though everything that a can prove is also provable in the way that b considers, but b can really prove a bit more. There's at least one formula that only b can prove and a isn't capable of proving. And it enables us to compare in the relativity theory of proofs, different approaches of proving properties. For example, it should be very obvious that di with invariance of the form E equals k is absolutely equivalent to di with invariance of the form E equals zero, because here we're focusing only on doing differential invariance proofs where only E equals zero is the only shape of differential invariance that we're allowed to use, whereas over here we allow any E equals k equation for a differential invariant. Of course, everything that this can prove, that's how it can prove just rather trivially, because all we need to do is choose zero for k. Well, that inclusion was easy. The slightly more interesting one is the other way around, that everything that we can prove by differential invariance of the form E equal k we can already prove using differential invariance of the form E equals zero, well, just by subtracting and considering E minus K equals zero, which is of the shape and obviously equivalent to E equals K. That was easy, but the question is now what happens when we look at more general classes of differential invariance. First of all, if F, if and only if G is a propositional tautology, so you can prove it just using the and left or left implies right and so on propositional proof rules. Or rather, it's a valid propositional formula instantiated in DL. Then if f is a differential invariant of a differential equation, x prime equals f of x within q, well then so is g and vice versa. If we have a propositional equivalent to tautology, then well both of them or neither of them is going to be a differential invariant. How can we prove that? Well, you can prove it by writing down a proof of one and reducing it to a proof of the other. So if you would like to show that f is a differential invariant, right, then what we can do is using the monotonicity and cut principle, reduce this to the question whether g is an invariant. Um, if f and g are equivalent, which we have assumed they are, here I'm changing the initial condition to one that is equivalent, and here I'm changing the post condition to one that is equivalent. Surely that doesn't change the question, except syntactically. Now, on this shape, I can use the differential invariant principle to say, well, that now reduces to the question whether the differential g prime of g holds after assigning the right-hand side of the differential equation to the left-hand side of the ODE within the evolution domain constraint. And that I'm now able to prove why, though. Well, if I assume that G is a differential invariant, how would I be able to use that F is a differential invariant? Because, well, it doesn't matter whether I write down F prime or G prime here, because since F and G are propositionally equivalent, so are the differential of F and differential of G. So it doesn't matter which of the two I'm writing down. So if one of them has a proof, the other one will have a proof as well. Because, well, the differential of a conjunction is the conjunction of differential differentials. And in fact, even the differential of the disjunction is the conjunction of the differential. So the point is, it survives any propositional rewriting. In other words, we can use any propositional normal form in our proofs because, well, they have the exact same deductive power anyhow. That's a good thing. That sounds like it, we're on a very good track to find out a lot of stuff in terms of equal deductive power for different classes of differential invariant. Now let's look at when f equivalent to g is valid, but it's a real arithmetic equivalence. So it's valid, it's in first of all logic of real arithmetic, 
but not just for propositional reasons where maybe we switched over a not not into the positive version or rewrote an implication by a not and an or and things like that. Well, let's try something. Um, here's a property that can be proved uh, to be a differential invariant easily. We do is differentiate the post condition by using the differentials everywhere. Then we get a zero, which of course the derivative of a constant is less or equal to x prime, and x prime is less or equal to zero. We put um, right hand side of ODE and for left hand side of ODE. And now there's the question whether um, zero is less or equal to minus x and minus x is less or equal to zero, which is the question whether x is zero, but that can't possibly have a proof because not all variable x are actually always zero. Hmm. <clears throat> I guess that was a non-proof. That's uh, a pity. Um, let's try something else. Well, let's try whether x squared less or equal to 5 squared um, is an invariant of x prime equals minus x because yeah, both, they're both equivalent, right, in the real arithmetic. This formula is equivalent to that formula, so you know it doesn't matter which one I use. Um, let's do a differential invariant proof. That gives us the derivative of x squared is 2x times x prime. You know, let's put in the right-hand side of the ODE for the left-hand side of the ODE. That gives us um, minus x here times 2x, so minus 2x squared. Uh, that's, of course, less or equal to 0, so this has a proof. Mm. Wait, what just happened? We didn't succeed in doing a proof with this linear arithmetic formulation by differential variance, but did succeed with a proof of this quadratic formulation with a differential variance, even though both of them were perfectly equivalent real arithmetic formulas. In other words, it simply isn't true that if I pick any arbitrary real arithmetic equivalence, and use differential invariance in one, that they will work on the other if and only if they worked on the former one. Because here it worked in quadratic form, but it didn't work in linear form. No surprise there, actually, because of course the differential invariance principles aren't just looking at the real arithmetic of things. They're looking at the differential structure, and the differential structure of x squared is completely different than the differential structure of, for example, just x which is why we get here x prime, but here we get a 2x x prime, uh, just to drag this point home. The set of all points where this is greater than 0 is equivalent to the set of all points where this is greater than 0, which is equivalent to the set of all points where this is greater than 0. All of them are. But their differential structures is completely different. This quadratic has a linear function as derivative, and this one has that as a derivative, and this funny one has that one as a derivative, and of course, whether this is greater than zero is completely different at the various points. So for example, here beyond zero, this is greater than zero, but that's only greater than zero beyond, well, whatever this is, 1.5 or so, and that's greater than zero only in this domain, and then in that domain, but not in between. So since differential variance, proving properties of differential equations by differentiating things, I guess we have to pay attention what the differential structure looks like. So even though all of those have the same arithmetic set being described by p greater than zero, they have very different sets described by their differentials, or in this came time, in this came case, derivatives p prime greater than zero. It's still okay, and we'll do that to normalize atomic formulas to have zeros on the right hand side. So we can still pretend all our formulas that our equations are of the form E equals zero, because, well, just put everything on the left-hand side. All greater or equal inequalities are E greater or equal zero. Again, put everything on the left-hand side, and likewise for A, E strictly bigger than zero. Because that just, in equivalent ways, changes the functions. Now, let's take a look, after we've seen that we have to pay enough attention at the first case. The question, how di equal and di equal and or, right? Wait, what was that question again? 
That's the class of all properties that are provable by just by single equational differential invariance. And that's the class of properties provable by differential invariance that are using equalities, ands, and ors. How do the two relate? Is there anything that this side can prove that that one cannot? Or is there anything that this side can prove that that one cannot? Well, one direction should be simple, right? If we can prove a property using a single equality as a differential invariant, then of course we can also prove it using a differential invariant where we would have had the opportunity to use equals and ands and ors, and we just didn't use the ands and ors, just use the equals. <laughs> so, so that syntactic class of differential invariants is obviously bigger than that one and includes all the single equalities. So, so that means you know, this is obvious. What about the other way around? Is there something that we can prove using equals and ands and ors as differential invariants that we can't prove just using a single equality as a differential invariant? Well, now that's a more complicated question. Mm, if we find out the answer, this helps us a lot in doing proof search and in particular invariant generation because we'll know whether it's important to look for ands and ors or whether it's not important to look for ands and ors in the equational case. All right. Turns out that there are ways of reducing ands and ors of equations to just single equations. Think about how you would do that. The two of these classes have the exact same deductive power. Everything I can prove with differential invariants of equations, I can also prove with differential invariants of equations, and and ors, obviously, but also the other way around. How do we prove that? Well, we give a reduction. We assume when one direction is easy, we can just argue about. The other inclusion is harder. We assume we have a proof where the differential invariant is using equals and ands and ors, and we reduce it somehow to a differential invariant proof that only uses equals. Two cases our differential invariant could use one of those disjunctions right here. For example, it could be of the shape E1 equals E2 or K1 equals K2. How can I rephrase this somehow if I only have equalities and no ors? Well, E1 equals E2 or K1 equals K2. Um, that's equivalent to E1 minus E2 is 0, and that's equivalent to K1 minus K2, K2 is 0. So the whole thing is 0 if and only if the product of the two differences is 0. That's good. Um, can we do something like this in the conjunction case? a way of reducing a conjunction to a single equation such that the conjunction is true if and only if the single equation is true. E1 equals E2, well that's still true if and only if E1 minus E2 is zero. K1 equals K2, that's still true if and only if K1 minus K2 is zero. And how do we, with a single equation, express the fact that both of these are true, so both of these are zero. Well, E1 minus E2, if it's zero, is exactly equivalent to the left conjunct being true. K1 minus K2 is exactly zero when the right conjunct is zero. And how do we write on an equation that holds if and only if both of these are zero? Well, E1 minus E2 is 0 if and only if its square is 0. K1 minus K2 is 0 if and only if its square is 0. Both of those squares are 0 if and only if their sum is 0. But, well, I just said it. That's true if and only if their sum of squares is 0 because squares of real numbers are always greater equal 0. They can only be 0 if, well, each of the 
squares individually is zero, which is precisely equivalent to the individual equations holding. So in other words, we have these two equivalences that are true in rule arithmetic and that we can use to successively reduce any disjunction of equations to a single equation, any conjunction of equations to a single equation. If we had a bigger formula using equals and ands and ors only, then we just keep on using these. And so we're done with the proof. Um, actually, we're not done with the proof. I mean, this is an awesome real arithmetic argument, but it doesn't tell us anything just yet about the differential structure of it. Remember how we got into trouble when we were just worrying about real arithmetic equivalences just a moment ago? So let's carefully think. What we do know is that these are just not just a disjunction of equations, but their differential is also provable for the particular differential equation we care about, and likewise that. They're not just conjunction of equations, their differential structure is preserved in the differential equation. So what we need to do is prove that the new equations are also provable as differential invariants, if and only if the old ones were. Or at least if the old ones were. So let's worry about it. Um, we do know that the differential of this is provable, and that's this formula. Uh, you know, right hand side of ODE, which is some f of x, is signed to x prime. And after that, um, if it's a differential variant, then we can prove that e1 prime equals e2 prime and k1 prime equals k2 prime. Um, but that also means that we can prove that e1 minus e2 times k1 minus k2 prime is zero. That's the differential of this. But why? Well, because the differential of a product is the left one differentiated times the right one plus the left one times the right one differentiated. And the left one differentiated is precisely the differential of e1 prime minus e2 prime and multiply k1 minus k2. And the right hand side is precisely leave e1 minus e2 alone and to form the differential of the right hand side. And that's the differential k1 prime minus k2. Prime. Uh, well, well, hold on a second. What do we know now? We do know that since this formula has a proof, we do know that these two differentials are the same. So in, the, in other words, that one here is actually zero. Uh, we multiply it with something, but that's okay. It'll still stay zero. And we also know that k1 prime equals k2 prime after this assignment this provable within the evolution domain constraint, but never mind that for this shorter version of the proof. In particular, these are also uh, zero, and they stay zero even if you multiply them with something, even if you add them, and so it, it indeed is true and will be provable that the, this entire differential um, is zero as well, so it has a proof. Cool. So if these had a proof, this single equation has a proof. Let's do the exact same idea for the conjunction case, where we assume that this is a differential invariant, in particular its differential will be provable in the particular ODE we care about, and then let's use that to prove that that one is, has a provable differential as well. So how do we do that? Well, we do assume that um, this differential, which is e1 prime equals e2 prime and k1 prime equals k2 prime, um, has a proof and is true, and we transform that to a proof of the other side. That has S differential. Differential applied to the enti entire term. Um, that, that's a sum, and the differential, of course, distributes over the sum, so it's the left-hand side differentiated and the right-hand side differentiated, and the whole thing added together. This is a square differentiated, so that will give us 2 multiplied down will give us 2 times the difference times the inner function differentiated by the rule of composition, which is derivable. Um, in fact, you could also adopt that as an axiom, but you can also mul remember what square means. It just means multiplication of the same thing with itself times the inner thing differentiated, so e1 prime minus e2 prime, and likewise on the other side. We've got a square function, so it's 2 times the inner one multiply the inner one prime, and the inner one prime is k1 prime minus k2 prime. The whole thing equals zero. So how do we now argue that that's actually zero? Well, again, we know that these two are equal, so that is actually zero. Okay. 
we know that these two are equal, so that is actually zero. And you know, if you keep on multiplying zeros with all kinds of other things, they stay zero. If we add them together, they stay zero. So yes, it will be true and provable that it's zero. Full proof you can look up here. Um, but we've seen now that atomic equations are enough. There's never a need to look at conjunctions and disjunctions of equations for differential variance. Notice, though, the degree of the polynomial that we look at increases. So there's a bit of a trade-off. Do we want more logical structure, or do we want more arithmetic structure? But at least it's always possible. If you never find a single equality to work as a differential variant, don't go looking for conjunctions and disjunctions of them. Now, that's a good starting point. How do they compare to full differential invariants? For example, how do they compare to differential invariants that have greater equals in them? And how do they compare to differential invariants that have equals in them? Well, in that case, equations are not enough, even though differential invariants with just equals are shockingly already the same as differential invariants with equals and ends and or that's not quite everything that differential invariants can prove and the reason is that differential invariants that use greater equals can prove not less than what differential invariants with equals can prove so there's something that these can prove that those can't prove so let's understand what we need to find now is something that's provable with di greater or equal, but unprovable with di equal, because that also justifies why general unrestricted di can do more than just di limited to equals. That, because the two of them are equivalent in terms of their deductive power, also argues why that is less than this. Well, it shouldn't be so hard for us to find something being proved by di greater or equal, but of course, it, we also need to pay attention to make sure that we can't prove it by di equal. Well, okay, here we go. Let's find something. x squared root of 0 is always um, true if it was true before when we're following x prime equals 5. Yeah, okay. This is an ODE we could also solve, but hey, we're in the business of understanding differential invariance now, so let's not, not go around solving this. We're proved by differential invariance, which will give us, you know, x prime greater root of 0, and then we plug in 5 for x prime, and we, that is the question whether 5 is greater root of 0. That has a proof. Um, spectacular. Um, what do we now do? We don't prove it with the i equal. Of, uh, I, I guess it, it, we can't directly prove it with the i equal because x greater or equal zero. Well, that's not of the shape of a single equality. Well, but that is then just one failed proof attempt, and of course. If you try one proof and it fails, that isn't a proof that you can't prove it in a different way. Remember back some set theory or linear algebra. The set of elements and that set of elements, there's a bijection between the two, or is there not a bijection between the two? Well, here there is one, right? I can I can draw it. I mean, I can. These two correspond, and those correspond, and those, and those, and those, and those. For example, I could have done it differently. So proving that two sets are bijective is, well, we give a bijection between the two, a function that takes us from one set to the other, and an inverse function that takes us backwards. And then we look at, you know, going this way and then going that way um, is the identity, and going that way and then going this way is the identity. So we give a bijection. But um, how do we prove, here it is, that two sets are not bijective? Well, start and bijection and bijection and bijection and bijection and, oh crap, that one doesn't have anything. Well, that was just one attempt of writing down a bijection. Maybe I was just too stupid. So instead, maybe I should have done this, and then that, and then this. Um, now that also wasn't a bijection because I left out this guy. Well, maybe I should have done it yet differently. You get the point. In order to prove that two sets are not bijective, I can't just write down one function and prove that it's not a bijection. I have to prove that there is no function between the two sets that is a bijection. How do we do this in set theory? We use an indirect criterion, the number of elements in finite sets, for example. It's particularly easy, but you could also do that in 
bigger sets. Um, what we use as a criterion that because this set has a different cardinality than that set, this set has six elements and that set has only five elements, and then we convince ourselves that the cardinality doesn't change when we're following bijections. That means if there would have been a bijection between the two sets, they would have had the same cardinality, but they don't have the same cardinality. Six isn't five, so there can't have been a bijection between the two. You find this indirect argument. Likewise, remember vector spaces. And the question whether two vector spaces that are given to you are isomorphic. For example, the vector space consisting of the x and y vector is very isomorphic to the vector space that consists of you know, a direction that I call x prime and a direction that I call y prime. Well, because all we need to do is, I don't know, identify them somehow. Maybe that was stupid that I identified x with y prime and y with x prime. Maybe it's more natural to do this way around, identify y with y prime and x with x prime. But the point is, it's not actually that important. We write down a function between the two vector spaces and then prove that it's an isomorphism. So um, not only does it give us a bijection going back and forth between the elements, but it also is a linear function both in the forward and in the backward direction. So we write it down and prove that it has all the properties of being an isomorphism. If somebody gives us two vector spaces, x, y, z, and x prime, y prime, then proving that they're not isomorphic, for that it isn't sufficient to just write down, you know, one attempt and say, well, this attempt didn't work. This function that identifies these uh, vectors is not a, uh, an isomorphism because we left out that entire um, direction there. Because, again, we need to prove that no isomorphism exists between the two, so we find an indirect criterion, the dimension. This is a three-dimensional vector space, and that over here is a two-dimensional vector space. And because dimension is preserved when we're following vector isomorphisms, the two can't have been isomorphic because the dimension of this one is smaller than the dimension of that one. That's an indirect argument why no isomorphism exists. Just like in set theory and algebra, proofs about impossibility are a bit harder because they're proofs about all ways of trying to identify something. So we need an indirect criterion here you know, to argue that not just one attempt of a proof that we're writing down with an equality as a differential variant doesn't prove this property, but none could have proved it. Let's develop something. I mean, we are without loss of generality, and that's where the more general proof comes in that I refer you to in the article. Cut and monotonicity can reduce this to some kind of equation. So where we're proving that p of x equals 0 is an invariant of the differential equation by applying the differential invariant proof rule to it. To use um, you know, the differential of p of x, p of x prime, and then write in the uh, right hand side of the ODE for the left hand side of the ODE. Unlike over here where we know it concretely, we can't just do it directly. But the question is, is there maybe a way of choosing a P such that this will actually prove? Well, maybe, but these down here also have to prove, and the point is they can't. Why? Well, because P of X has to be zero whenever x is greater than zero. And p of x equals zero also has to imply that x is greater than zero, but that doesn't work because if we had a univariate polynomial that is actually zero on all of those initial points, x greater than zero, then a univariate polynomial that has infinitely many zeros must be the zero polynomial. This zero polynomial would very much prove this, right? Because zero prime equals zero is easily proved. And zero equals zero is also true in all the states that satisfy x squared equals zero. But, of course, if we have proved that zero equals zero afterwards, we can't conclude from that that x must have been greater than zero because zero equals zero is maximally uninformative. Okay, so we found out that Sometimes, when we're interested in proving 
inequalities, we actually need to use inequalities for differential invariance. We can not settle for equations instead. How does greater than compare to all the properties provable by differential invariance and all? And how do equals and greater than compare? We know the answer for greater equal and equal, but we don't know it for equal and greater than. And also, those two are not enough. So focusing on differential invariance, I mentioned only greater than, is not enough because um, not every property provable by inequality as a differential invariant is also provable by a greater than um, formula as a differential invariant. So equalities are important, in other words. Um, let's understand that. Again, we need to find something that is provable by di equals but isn't provable by greater than as differential invariance. Um, well, for example, v square plus w square c square is an invariant of um, v prime equals w and w prime equals minus v, which is the rotational ODE. We prove that directly just by applying the differentials here. 2 v v prime plus 2 w w prime equals 0 because constants don't have interesting uh, differentials. Um, and then we plug in the right-hand side of the ODE for the left-hand side of the ODE, and then these cancel, and then we prove it in real arithmetic easily. Well, that was great. Now we need to prove why we can't prove it with a strictly greater than. Of course, you know the drill. You can't just write down one proof of a greater than as a differential invariant and argue that this didn't prove the property. You need to prove that no proof with greater than formulas only as differential invariants could have ever proved this. And so we need an indirect argument, and the argument that this e greater than zero is pretty much an open set, but v squared plus w squared equals c squared is a closed set. Um, what is open and closed sets? For example, v squared plus w squared is less equal to one. That's the entire disk, including the full boundary. But v squared plus w squared is less than one. That's the open disk. It excludes the boundary. And since this is a closed set, it can't be equivalent to an open set. Well, except when it would be true or false, because true or false correspond to the entirety of the state space or the empty set, both of which are classical Euclidean spaces, the only spaces that are both open and closed. So, but neither true or false are useful for doing any of those proofs because, well, true is true in the beginning but doesn't imply the post condition because we can't learn anything from the formula true being true in the state because it's true everywhere. And false, well, that would imply the post condition, but it simply is very hard to prove that it's true in the beginning because false isn't true when v squared plus w squared equals c squared is true because there are states where this equation holds true. So that's the reason why these two are separated. How do equational differential invariants with ands as and ors compare with differential invariants that have just greater equals? Well, this sounds like a lot more, remember, however, that this was actually the same as just di for just a single equality. So they sound a lot closer already, uh, but they're still different. And this is a greater goal, and this is an equal. Since we just saw a number of interesting differences, we might suspect that these are completely different, but you can still do something clever. Namely, you can show that everything that's provable with equalities, and even ends and ors by the argument I just made, is also provable with just a single greater or equal inequality. How so? Well, we need to find out that if something is provable with di equal, then it's also provable by di greater or equal. Because, well, di equal and di equal with ands and ors are already of equivalent deductive power. So we can always first reduce it to that. Of course, I can't assume anything specific about the proof uh, and the differential in equation and even the property that we have here because it's supposed to work for every proof we have here. The only thing we can assume is that apparently it's differential invariance for all single equalities. So if we have a single equality, 
has proved it to be a differential invariant anywhere. Then well, the way that works is by proving the differential E prime is zero after assigning right hand side of the ODE to left hand side within the evolution domain constraint. So that somehow has a proof. Otherwise, di equal wouldn't prove it. And now we need to reduce this to a way of proving it with just greater equals. And so I guess we need to find an inequality that implies that E is equal zero and is also true when E is equal zero. So it, you know, it better be equivalent to E equals zero. Do you find an inequality that is equivalent to E being zero? Squares, right? Squares is at least a very reliable sign. So if squares are zero, uh, the number itself must be zero. Let's exploit that. Minus e square is greater or equal to zero, of course, if and only if e is zero. Well, without the minus, it wouldn't work, right? e square is always greater or equal to zero, so that would be a stupid question. But minus e square greater or equal to zero, that's precisely equivalent to e itself must have been zero, because minus e square is always less or equal to zero. If it's supposed to be greater or equal to zero as well, it must have been zero. And now we can use the differential variant principle for it. So reduce this to a minus 2e e prime, greater equal to zero. Um, and that we now need to argue why we can prove this if we can prove that. How do we do that? Well, apparently, according to this, we have a proof that after we put f of x into x prime by an assignment, e prime is zero. We are in a state where we've just put f of x into x prime. And since we over here within the evolution domain constraint Q, which we have readily available on both sides, E prime equals zero is provable. Then, of course, minus two E times E prime greater than zero is also provable because E prime is equal zero is already provable. Notice for this proof how crucial it was that we had this local view of logic on differentials in order to just worry about, well, in this state, something, something, something is true, as opposed to having to worry about, oh, along the ODE, let's worry about the solution, which would have been very complicated. Also notice, yet again, even though this reduction tells us that we can happily focus on weak inequalities if you wanted to, because equations and even conjunction and disjunction of them are not substantially important, the degree still increases. So there's, again, a trade-off of using more logic or using more arithmetic. Look at all the atomic cases. So how do single inequalities compare to inequalities of conjunctions and disjunctions? Well, certainly everything we can prove with single greater or equal, we can also prove with differential variants that have greater equal and would have been able to use ands and ors, we just don't use them. So that's obvious. The question is the other way around. Just like that's obvious. But the other way around for equality turned out a single equation and the conjunction disjunction of the equations were equivalent in deductive power, but that's actually not the case for inequalities. DI greater equal is strictly less deductively powerful than di with greater equals and actual logic around it with answers and wars. That's the proof idea. Okay, we need to find something that we can prove with this that we can prove with that. The converse is obvious. Um, here is the x greater equals zero and y greater equals zero in an variant of the differential equation x prime equals five and y prime equals y square. Um, that we prove by reducing it to the question whether x prime greater equal zero and y prime greater equal zero. Plugging in the numbers gives us the question whether five is greater equal zero. Yep, it is. And whether y squared is greater equal zero. Yep, it is. So that has an obvious proof. And now we need to prove that we can prove it with a single inequality. And that's admittedly kind of hard. The rationale is that if we have a polynomial in the variables x and y that is supposed to be greater or equal zero, and again, by the argument, these have to imply that p of x, y is greater or equal to zero, and those as a post condition have to be implied by p of x, y greater or equal to zero, and that means p of x, y greater or equal to zero has to be equivalent to x greater or equal to zero and y greater or equal to zero. 
actually accurately capture what we know in the beginning and what we want to know in the end. But that is impossible because if this equivalence holds true, then because, well, 0 is greater or equal to 0, also p of x0 has to be greater or equal to 0 if and only if x itself is greater or equal to 0. But that means p of x0, so plugging 0 in for y, is 0. Um, but now, again, this is 0 for an entire x greater or equal to 0 set, and that means this must be the 0 polynomial. And then, you know, okay, admittedly, the rest of the proof is kind of hard to show that it also couldn't have been the other way around. Just look at the, the journal for more details, but that's sort of the intuition behind it. It also still turns out here in this example, differential cuts are still possible to just prove things one at a time. For example, first prove that x is greater equal to zero, and then prove that y is greater equal to zero, and then you have two differentially cut in steps where each of them was using just a single greater or equal as a differentiating variant, and that would have given you a proof. But there also is a much more sophisticated analysis that shows that not in this example, but in the more complicated example, there is not even a way of proving it with lots of differential cuts in addition. Again, look at this reference. So, speaking of differential cuts, how useful are they? Gerhard Gensen's seminal result was on cut elimination, that if we like to prove that B follows from the assumptions A, then Gensen's cut says, how about we first prove C from A? We can leave B or around, that's not so important for the argument. And then prove, prove that A together with the assumption C proves what we were originally interested in. So prove a lemma and then use it. That's Gerhard Gensen's cut, a schnitt. And Gerhard Gensen's cut elimination says that you don't need this proof rule which means everything you can prove with first proving a lemma and then using a lemma, you can also prove without it. Admittedly, George Boulos, very many decades later on, proved that you still maybe shouldn't be limited in cuts because even in simple propositional logic, there's cases where the proof with a cut fits on half a page and the proof after cut elimination in some specifically crafted cases um, doesn't fit on all the papers in the universe, but okay, never mind. So, Gerhard Gensen's cut elimination says that cuts can always be eliminated, that they're not that important. And now, it is natural to ask if well, the same thing is true for differential cuts, and it turns out the answer is no. There's the no differential cut elimination theory. Proving that the deductive power with differential cuts strictly exceeds the deductive power without it. So if we allow differential variance and differential cuts, then we do get strictly more than if we just do differential variance proofs. Sure, everything we can prove with just differential variance reasoning, we can also prove with differential variance reasoning where we would have been allowed to use differential cuts. That's easy. What's interesting is to see that this has strictly bigger deductive power. There are formulas you can only prove with a differential cut, but you can't prove without a differential cut. And in fact, the same theorem is also true for differential ghosts. Even if you allow differential variance and differential cuts, if in addition you allow differential ghosts, the deductive power exceeds the power without it. So there are some questions where you really need to use differential ghosts in order to be able to prove it. In fact, differential ghosts are shockingly powerful. For example, they can prove all equational invariants of polynomial differential equation systems. Let's just shortly convince ourselves why differential cuts can be helpful without going down the rabbit hole of the actual proof. Well, here's a question whether x cubed is greater than or equal to minus 1 when we follow this differential equation. And we could try to prove it by differential invariants, but we will fail because x cubed derived gives us 3 square x prime. That, if you plug in the right-hand side of the ODE for the left-hand side, gives us the question that inherently involves y by way of y power 5. And, you know, even if we can easily conclude that x squared is greater than 0, we don't know anything about the sign of y power 5, and so we cannot prove that this is greater than 0. This is not a valid formula. But 
you have to know something on y power 5 in order to have a chance to prove something about x. Well, actually, we see that from the structure, right? We're interested in how the value of x is, but how x changes depends on how y change. So unless we know something about the value of how y changes, we never have a chance to prove anything about it. We could have seen that right away. Differential cuts to the rescue. For this question, we first ask ourselves whether y power 5 is greater than 0 always. And it is because the differential of that is 5 y power 4 times y prime. Plug in right hand side of ODE for left hand side. Gives us 5 y power 4 times y power 2, which is y power 6. And that's certainly greater than 0. So done. And after we do this differential cut, because we have the assumption readily available in the beginning, we can assume it in the evolution domain constraint from now on, and then do the proof that this is now inductive by, you know, using again the differential of x cubed, which is 3x squared x prime, um, and then plug in, and um, here now we have enough knowledge about y power 5 being greater than 0. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter which positive constant that was. So the whole thing actually proves. Let me just give you a brief indication of what we just talked about is useful for by playing with norms and degrees for doing proofs about curves. You remember this result, how arithmetic equivalences were not acceptable in differential invariance proofs about further thinking because you can make proofs work or not work. Let's exploit that by changing arithmetic to equivalent forms that are in real arithmetic equivalent but have a different differential structure and use that for a benefit. For example, let's prove that a supremum norm um, is less or equal t when we're following a differential equation. Well, this supports a supremum norm. This I guess maximum distance and that that means that both x and y are within the bound t and minus t. So the supremum norm is at most t, even only if the maximum is most t, which is just this conjunction. Okay, so we can prove this um, by doing a differential cut to prove that v squared plus w squared is less equal to 1. Having done so, um, which isn't hard to prove that that is indeed true, but I'm not going to do this. Um, having done so, you can then uh, use differential invariance precisely on the supremum norm, which will here give you minus t prime, less or equal x prime, less or equal t prime, and minus t prime, less or equal y prime, less or equal t prime, just the differential of the whole thing, um, and then replace the left-hand side of the differential equations with the right-hand side to give us minus 1 is less equal v is less equal 1, and minus 1 is less equal w is less equal 1, which of course in general we can prove, but we can prove after we've successfully done this differential cut that v squared plus w squared is at most 1. Because then, well, I guess v itself must have been at most 1 and most between minus 1 and 1, and so w, so this is easily proved. That was a piece of cake. Let's prove the same thing for the 2 norm, the Euclidean norm that just says, you know, it's less or equal t if and only if x squared plus y squared is less or equal t squared. Prove that, again, by differential cut to, to prove that v squared plus w squared is at most 1. That proof is easily done. Then, you know, to prove this by differential invariance, uh, which gives us 2xx prime plus 2yy prime less or equal to 2tt prime. Differentials mapped over that. Replace left hand side of, put in uh, right hand side of ODE for left hand side of ODE which gives us 2xv plus 2yw is less or equal to 2t, well, and the 1 that is the slope of the time variable. And that's now hard to prove, because even if we do know that v squared plus w squared is at most 1, still the signs could, you know, change these arbitrarily to make it bigger than 2t. And that means, of course, that we have no way of proving it. It was essentially almost the same question, right? With the Euclidean norm bound, the proof was completely straightforward. It's linear, right? With a higher degree, Euclidean degree norm, it was not provable. So sometimes lower degrees are better than higher degrees. But also, even if lower degrees help here, 
the two norms are very intimately related because we can map one to the other by proving in real arithmetic that the two norm is at most the square root of the dimension times the supremum norm, and it is bigger than the supremum norm. Likewise, the supremum norm is at most the Euclidean norm, and it's bigger than 1 over square root of the dimension times the Euclidean norm. So they're very closely related. For example, this is the unit circle, the set of all points where the two norm, the Euclidean norm is the circle one. It has distance from the center at most one in all directions. This is the set of all points where the supremum norm is at most one. You know, the maximum of the differences to the center is at most one. So of course, that's a bit bigger. But within this, you also find the set of all points in this square where the supremum norm is at most one over square root of dimension, in this case two, which by these inequalities sits inside that. And there's also a circle around that, right? There's a circle that says the set of all points where the distance is at most square root of two. And so the norms are actually interrelated to one another, which you can exploit for doing proofs. You should always benefit from norm relations in your proofs to simplify them, but you should also remember that these are actual x approximation errors that give you extra error factors. But it's still better to see on the conservative side. Summarizing, what we've seen today is the differential invariant chart filled in. That, for example, differential invariants provable with just equalities are equivalent in terms of the deductive power to equalities with logical ands and ors. Um, these two are equivalent and included strictly in this class of all properties provable by greater equals as differential invariants. So these are more powerful than those, but include all of that. These are less than what happens when you're using conjunctions and disjunctions and inequalities, uh, in which these are included as well. DI greater than equal and DI greater than are uh, incomparable, unsurprisingly, because there's some questions that only greater or equals can even characterize, and other questions that only greater than can characterize. These two are also incomparable. Um, it's included in. Uh, a, and and or, so logical conjunctions and disjunctions over strictly greater than help in the inequality cases, but it doesn't matter in the equality cases. Um, here it's the same because adding the equality, if you already have greater equals, apparently doesn't change anything. So these are equivalent, but here something still changes because the equality and the greater than can characterize, you know, for example, different open and, and, and closed sets. So here it actually does still change something. And everything is included in full differential invariant. So all the operators are ultimately relevant for differential invariant proofs, which is a story that is twisted in exciting ways whenever you also, in addition, study differential cuts. We've seen a rich theory and structure behind differential invariants which also means that you should scrutinize what property can be proved with what invariant, which we have done generically here, but you should be doing in the applications you really worry about. And you should be using provability sanity checks, like, for example, the question that I have, can I even do that with an open invariant, or does it need to be closed? Should it be even mixed? Stay away from that as far as possible. Uh, can it be a univariate invariant, or does it have to worry about more of the variables? Which overall is starting the exciting field of real differential semi-algebraic geometry, where we're drawing from a lot of knowledge and insights in terms of how to combine real arithmetic, real geometry insights with the differential structure that we need to, in order to faithfully represent differential engineering and differential equations reasoning, where we're exploiting differential cuts in these circumstances also to obtain more knowledge.